All right, so welcome. I uh, hope everybody gets something out of this. We're gonna be talking about speed and how to make athletes faster. Um, something I've been doing for a while, but uh, first we'll start to talk about, uh, about myself, um, who I am, what I do. So my name is Gary Kablein, owner of Evo Sports Training. Um, started that uh, back in 08. Um, been coaching for a little over five years. Um, married for 20 years, got three daughters, 12, 10, and eight. Um, I ran track for most of my life, played a little stint of football, but um, ended up getting a detached retina. Um, so hence the sunglasses, and I had to put a, uh, this thing in front of a, a window to get the light so you can actually see me. So not trying to be cool, but just being sensitive to the light. So uh, yeah, I ended up losing my vision in my right eye. Uh, so just stuck with track. So um, went to Long Beach State. Um, my dad was my sprint coach of all things. I was gonna go to Oregon, but my dad got the sprint job. So stayed home. Uh, so born and raised in Long Beach. Got my degree uh, in kinesiology. And then I started coaching, kind of following my dad's footsteps, just had the passion for it, which uh, sure gave him a hard time because I questioned everything that he did. So, uh, um, but then after college, um, I started running track for the Philippines. Um, my dad's from the Philippines, so ran for the Philippines from 96 to 2006. Um, after that, it was a question of, okay, now I'm still coaching people. I actually went and went to the junior college level, started coaching track there, had a guy, uh, went 1030s. Um, he got drafted as a free agent because um, he went low 4-2 at his pro day for Utah and Conroy Black. And of course the Raiders picked him up. Um, so yeah, then I was, when I was doing that, I started Evo um, while coaching and working at UPS. So literally for three years, I was doing all three um literally three hours of sleep every night so that didn't last long three years and I was pretty much fed up um I've had three Olympians uh, that I've trained um sprinters hurdlers uh, been the national coach for Nigeria Belize Haiti and France um so track is my passion um I got into football because um my dad was of course my uh, speed coach and he was training Byron Jackson, who was the older brother, quite older brother of Deshaun. So I started training Deshaun when he was young, while I was in college, and then just kind of snowballed from there. We just kind of, he stuck with me, I stuck with him throughout the years, and um, we're going into year 14, and uh, hopefully he's, uh, and he just got released by the Eagles. Uh, he had some rough times with the Eagles with the, with the injuries, one fluky and one just a, a load problem with uh, too much too much load on him. Um, I also had Chris Conti since um, high school he played and was picked up by the Bears and then with Tampa Bay so he was in the league for eight years. Uh, he was a safety and then I had John Ross of course um, he's probably the most known of, of my athletes because of the 40-yard dash record running 4-2-2. He came in running 4-5-3 and one of the biggest things that I always and we'll talk about is, you know, knowing your athlete. So um, that's one of the big things with him and how we got him faster. Um, I've also trained big guys. So David Osbury um, was a, a tight end, 253 pounds, uh, ran a 446. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to go like briefly into the training part. Um, and there's a lot of things I'm sure maybe you, a lot of you know, but I don't like to assume. And I think it's really important information, but um, I think one of the biggest things that I tell people all the time, we had a new intern from the East Coast um, and they're a little bit different from the West Coast, uh, but you gotta have your own philosophy. You know, um, if you don't have your philosophy, you'll fall for anything. So in this day and age, when you have social media and everybody's doing everything, you're not gonna look at everything and just fall for it. And you, you gotta put it into your philosophy. Well, does this fit my philosophy? And if it does, then you, you use it and you try it out. And normally I usually try everything before I give it to my athletes. Um, but that's a, you know, one of those things where you, you gotta get a feel for what it is, how it is and how your athletes will adjust to it. Um, also knowing the body, just basic anatomy. Um, 
knowing your individual is also another one. I think mentally, just knowing the athlete mentally, how they um, handle stress, how they handle pressure also can help get them to that next level. I so see for track, it's, it's very mental. So knowing the athlete, knowing um, even how they recover from certain workouts, uh, whether it takes them a day or two. I had an athlete, one of the girls that trained for Nigeria, if I gave her two days of recovery, that third day when she's coming back, she feels lethargic just because it was too many days off or something. So, and then the other athlete I had um, from Belize, he, he could take a week off and come back and feel great where she would be like, just, I, she can't do anything. She's done. She's got to get back into it slowly. Um, I'm a big proponent of, you know, education. So one of the, um, Books that I read and like and, and talk with is Ralph Mann um, with mechanics of sprinting and hurling. Obviously, a lot of you guys are football players so the, um, and coaches, so hurdling won't be a thing, but that's kind of like my thing. I ran hurdles in college and professionally, so that's been a, a great book. Um, the other book, um, The Talent Code, which is a huge um, thing for learning and myelin and how the body learns and grows. It's an awesome book. It's actually really good good little read so um and I, I consider knowledge and experience as like a a tool belt like you got all these tools in your belt and then with certain athletes you're going to need certain tools and with other athletes you're going to need other tools so it's just a matter of uh you know having them there in just in case type of thing you know so you can always rely on those and um come back and maybe one of these days you're like oh well I remember reading this and I, I'm going to try it out because this person, it might work for. So those are, those are huge. Um, and then um, talking about sprinting, it's that sprinting has its own little fluidity, its own movement synchronization. And there's a, um, you can see it happen in the lead athletes and there's a chain that it has to flow to. And it's, glute down you got to be able to fire and if you see a lot of athletes that have bad mechanics usually they're firing and they're misfiring and usually put too much stress on the hamstring because you alleviate uh, the glute um, the other thing is the energy systems so knowledge and and knowing what energy systems uh when you're running are using what for the most part for speed it's all the you know anaerobic so um, got to know which ones are which a lot of people, you know, will will start to do, uh, more of the, uh, anaerobic lactate or, um, in the lactate phase or even aerobic phase thinking you can get faster. And, um, we all know that, uh, running, uh, far learning long distance is not going to help with the, the speed. Um, the seven laws of training, um, I don't know if everybody's familiar with that, but as a coach, I think that kind of helps us kind of get in the right direction. Um, I'll read them off real quickly. It's the law of individual differences. Obviously, not everybody's built the same. Uh, overcompensation principle, you know, body will adjust, right? So overload. Um, so that can be in many ways, whether more reps, uh, more weights, uh, more days of training. Um, you got the said principle. Um, so it's like being like we talked about running miles or being an aerobic part, um, running miles is not going to help you, um, help with your sprinting. So you got the use and disuse principle, uh, use it or lose it basically. Um, the gas principle, which is general adaptation of syndrome. So it's, um, just, it's managing loads. So if you had hit it hard one day, you don't want to come back and hit it again the next day. Usually they're going to um, just start breaking apart. If you could put stack too many of those hard days back to back. And the last one, uh, the specificity, I just keep things very specific for what you're, for what they're doing. Like you're not going to have linemen uh, running, you know, sixties, one fifties, um, just kind of keep it short and very specific to, you know, what you, what's at hand. Um, uh, let's talk about it. We can go to sprint myths. There's a lot of myths about um, uh, a lot of sprinting. Uh, one, you can't coach speed. Um, that was the case. I'd be out of a job a long time ago. Um, 
I kind of believe where it got started is you don't have time to coach speed in some of these instances with some of the, especially NFL. I know their program and, you know, as soon as they get in, they're basically right into um, football. So uh, they're professionals and they should be doing that uh, on their own. So um, next one, run on your toes. Uh, I spend probably weeks, if not months, teaching people how to land a little bit flatter to where they can uh, get a better stretch and not over striding on um, when they're running. A lot of times they just, everyone's told to run on your toes and it's more midfoot, getting the more stretch out of the Achilles calf. Um, next one, elbows locked at 90. Um, there is some movement to the elbow when you throw in that arm back. Um, because of the force, the elbow will open up. And then when you close it and you bring it up into the front of your face, it kind of, that angle closes less than 90. Um, and that's just a fluid thing and, and not keeping it really stiff like that. But I mean, there's people I've heard and just, they were like, this tell you keep your arms locked at 90. And they're like, yeah. So, um, and it just makes them really stiff. The next one is a uh, lower body strength training. Uh, all lower body strength training is beneficial for speed. Um, we all know that if you if you train and lift like a bodybuilder for your legs, it's not going to help for speed. Um, looks good, but it's not going to help you run fast. Um, all resistance training is beneficial for speed. Uh, that's not the case either. Um, sand running on sand will increase speed. Uh, it just makes it harder. Um, Great for someone like me in upper 40s. Um, it's hard work, cardio is great, uh, less um, stress on my joints, um, but it's not gonna do what you want it to do for speed. Speed is about putting down a power in a short amount of time and you can't do that on uh, sand. Um, another one, repeat 200s, 400s as speed work. I know a lot of soccer or distance runners, they know we did speed work and He's like, what did you do? And he's like, oh, we did repeat fours. And yeah, speed usually six seconds or less. Um, and then also the last but not least is running on a treadmill will increase your speed. Um, just because of the mechanic, um, if you ever tried, and you can try this uh, if you have a treadmill, if you normally, where you land, you're supposed to push forward. If you run correctly, you will run into the front of the treadmill. Um, so you, what your uh, next thing you're doing, your body adjusts, and now it just pushes you up and down and not going forward at all. Um, so that's one of the myths. Um, the next one is, is a little bit about stretching. Um, stretching should be done when the core temperature is warm. It shouldn't be done in the morning, early morning. That's just, you're just kind of like your body's not warm enough to kind of get into um, that type of mobility. So you kind of wait until the core temperature is warm. I know one of my mentors, um, Charlie Francis would have Ben Johnson wake up, you know, four hours before a race. And if he had the pre like the heats in like eight in the morning, yeah, he was up at four in the morning. Um, so that's where the core temperature has to be warm in order to, to perform. Um, so before exercises or competitions, you can hold it for six seconds and then release. And you can do that multiple times. Um, if you need to. Um, now, if you want to get and work on flexibility, you'd want to do that in the evening when your core temperature is at its warmest. And you can also just basically shut everything down before you go to sleep, which will also help uh, for recovery purposes. So at night, hold for like a minute and um, that'll help with the, the growth hormone effect and everything else and, and flexibility. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is, is acceleration and then top end. All right. So we're going to kind of break those two up and get into um, some of this um, and talk about uh, posture and angles for acceleration and max velocity. They're pretty much you, the, the same. You, you have to have both posture and angles uh, to get to your max and, and get you to, to the best part. Um, and this video is um, Jeremy, who was at the uh, combine. Uh, you can see we'll kind of go and, and just 
it's all about this the setup, right? So he's very strong, so he can get away with a little bit tighter angles than a lot of people. Um, he's super strong, just a, a beast of a guy running back for Tennessee. Um, and then what you can see is uh, the angles that he's able to push out at and see the shoulders kind of going forward, staying big, and then getting that full extension in that straight line um, going forward at a good angle. Um, and then we'll play this for you now. I'll rewind it. And then just pushing back. The biggest thing is if you can see, once you get the acceleration in and you get the extension, that right foot thigh has to come back and go back into the ground and leave a little bit behind their center of mass. So you'll see his foot starting to travel backwards and then it hits the ground and now the hips are going forward. So I'll let you see it at full speed. All right, so that's that's pretty much one of the keys is, is uh, that horizontal force right at the beginning. As you go, it will translate into um, a vertical, um, but we really got to work on these first five, 10 yards because you're literally at like 60% of, of speed in the first five to 10 yards. So really getting up to power and pushing back into the ground and driving that knee forward while staying pretty stiff in the upper body and everything just, just pushing forward. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, like I said, proper you know setup is key, but also um, being able to track everything I think is also with online people that we have doing our online program. Um, timing is, is, is huge and being able to time these tens, whether it be uh, 10 yard starts or flying tens, uh, starts for 20. Um, we want to see where they started from, where they uh, end up. Like I said, with John, he came in at four five three and ended up at a, a four two two. And there wasn't. I don't. I don't take full credit, um, but someone also has to take credit for not keeping his speed up throughout the season. And I think that's one thing we'll kind of talk about a little bit as we uh, at the end. And of course, if you guys have questions, feel free. Type them in. Um, and uh, we'll try to get to a lot of questions. I think I would, that's where we can kind of get really down into it and wherever you like have questions and see, and we can go kind of go down that hole of uh, getting the answers to that. Um, but yeah, so we'll, with our uh, online group, um, we'll use the, the Jaku watch and just have that consistent timing of their tens and where they can see they're making changes with um, as their body positions start to change. Um, as we talked about, you saw the, the shin angles of them coming up, um, matching um, their body their, uh, when they come out. So let's see here. So yeah, if you see it right there, his shin and his trunk should be the same angle, which it is in this one. He has a problem with this left one. He puts it out a little bit further because he's trying to stay big, which is, um, that's the dilemma when you're trying to get them to accelerate out and push out and be, be uh, big and uh, get a, um, a good amount of horizontal force pushing forward is they try to have a tendency to push and elongate and then step out a little bit too far, as you'll see when he comes through with his next foot. It's a little bit higher than what the trunk is. Um, so that's you know one of those things you got to be cognizant of and having him being able to push back and get that uh, that shin angle back a little bit uh, further. Um, one way that we like to try to get those positions and the lower the low foot coming through, as you can see, his foot kind of comes through decently low. Um, is bounding. If you look at this position it will look exactly like this position here when he does, this is Deshaun, who I've just uh, trained for the last, uh, since he was eight. I don't know why he's not playing, but um, let's see. Oh. I lost. There it is. 
So you see that he's punching his knee forward, driving that leg all the way back to get good extension, right? This is his, what we do for conditioning for him to, to get that separation in the game. He's got like a 25 pound weight vest. Um, it, this also, you know, for him, it works a lot of separation, but also is great for teaching acceleration. It's the same punch of the knee forward, the drive extension in the back, the low heel recovery and the big arms. So, and then that can lead them into getting that feeling of that motion of, of the acceleration. Wall drills also help if you're leaning up at a, on a wall, just kind of going through the leg motion, especially if you have younger kids, that'll help a lot. Um, and then also, this is uh, DJ Reed, um, the switching of the leg, you know, so once you drive the knee forward, you got to switch it back and then getting it back into the ground with that low heel, heel recovery. Now, one of the things we like to do is go resisted and then unresisted. Basically, we're just getting that um, nervous system to fire um, and then slowing things down a little bit so they can feel it. I'm a big proponent of them feeling it and not seeing it. A lot of people want to see video. And especially if you got combine guys, I think it's um, one of those things where if I can cue them and make changes um, right there on the fly, and that way we don't have that many bad reps go through a whole day and we go back and watch film and be like, oh, well, you did this wrong. Well, they still can't feel it. They're sitting down in the chair looking at it. Um, I like to try to make those cues or changes right then, right there. Um, and sometimes with the, uh, with the sled, it slows things down and then um, they can feel it. And then we're all, the next rep, hopefully we're, we're better and make the changes within that eight weeks that we have. So you see, and there's one of the very few, uh, one of the first times he's done it. We're just trying to stay big, getting that range of motion in. Um, and pushing back into the ground, kind of trying to stay low with that heel. So yeah, that's uh, one of our things that we like to do. This is um, John Ross the night before he ran his 4 2, two. Um, I, I've said if he started like this start at the combine, he could have run 4-1. I don't know, it sounds awkward or um, out there as far as how speed, but um, a little backstory, um, he had knee surgery. So when he went to the doctors, they were manipulating his knee, making sure, but they pinched like a nerve back in his calf. So when he cramped up after his 40, it was because of um, that uh, day before um, and uh, what they were doing to see if his knees were good. Um, but here's his start. As you can see, um, he'll get those shoulders forward. So I, a lot of times I like to say for them to think of their shoulders being parallel to the ground and just pushing those shoulders forward rather than popping up and getting right at like a 45 degree angle. Um, a lot of these guys want to come up and that's one of the, the common mistakes of starting is, 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 being quick and choppy, like trying to get as many steps in as possible. Um, and then there's also the, the people who feel like they got to put a lot of power. So they're, then they go side to side um, and, or there's and people that just try to run right out of it and they're cycling heel the butt right from the beginning. So he, here's one of uh, probably his, his best starts and uh, you can see. Oh, what Obviously that don't work. Hopefully it plays. So in this run compared to what he did in uh, at the combine the next day, he was just more patient. And, you know, uh, like he said, when he got into the blocks, he had to step up and gain his composure because just the adrenaline of him being out there by himself with all 32 teams in attendance watching it's um, the stress is probably unimaginable. So he was just a little bit more patient, a little bit bigger angle was better. And his top end would have been better at the end. Um, 
so yeah, you always wish he had another run, but um, and not not the case. So, um, but yeah, so that's one of the biggest things that we do um, with our athletes is the contrasting, um, the bounding. Uh, we even do um, resisted bounds, um, but we like to contrast it a lot and then get um, from uh, one place to the next and really get that extension. Um, here's a. 295 pound guy um also getting some acceleration work in right so he doesn't go as far as a lot of other guys but he's he's doing really well and getting angles right and pushing out um big guy moving fast and so um it's the same principles apply you know obviously top end is not going to be as high so he's going to come up a little bit early got a lot of force and a lot of a lot of power right um, we like to use Prowler. Um, uh, we like also the sled, like we mentioned, um, and then extra genie is great. Uh, 1080 is awesome. If you want to put that, uh, amount of money down, but I still think you can get by with, um, other cheaper, uh, methods, right? So, um, this is the Prowler. Basically what we're doing, the same thing, teaching the bounding, slow heel recovery, um, put a lot of power to the ground, keeping good angles, that, that core, making it uh, stay tight. Uh, here's Deshaun pushing. Right? So that's that's the key. It's just um, very specific to the training. Um, this um, transfers us into more of the top end, and, and it's all, again, like a posture and angles. Um, this was back when I was actually in shape. Um, and you can see that at top end, when your body in, in, is under full weight, you should make a, a four, um, as you can see there. Um, those are the positions you are trying to hit. Um, once you're in top end, it's all about vertical forces, so putting force back down on the ground. How I like to, to explain a, the, a lot of it to the kids is like, I'm old school. So you, back in the day, you flip your bike over and you have your tire and you spin your tire. Um, it's, it's just like that. Even the, the acceleration part, if you can try to accelerate the wheel, you're going to get it from high and you're going to do a really long and powerful motion and, and then go. But once the wheel starts spinning, you have that little point in the tire where you're just going to paw at the tire and pull it and just snap it back, right? So you don't wanna be here and, and be short, spinning the tire. You do wanna come up, but you don't need to go way up and down. There's that little same motion. So same thing with um, the top end speed, you know? So um, you have your two parts to top end, you got your air time and ground contact time, right? So now it's all about, you know, recovery so as soon as you go from the toe off position once you leave your foot leaves the ground you're basically in the recovery mode so that's where we talk about and you've heard of i'm sure everybody's heard of the front side mechanics you try to get back to front side as quick as possible right so as soon as you leave you want to draw a straight line where that foot and heel come straight back underneath your hips right that way you get back into the, the position um, where the knee is driven forward. And then now you're changing the direction and applying force down where that um, the shin, tib, fib will snap back and go back into the ground like the tire, right? So um, hopefully, you know, that makes, makes some sense. Um, um, there's a couple of things about, um, top end or max velocity is you can see when you when you do speed work and top end work you can see higher peak uh vertical forces than you would in in any type of squat or deadlift um so that's where you know speed is king you have to do it you know there's no really ways around it you can't there's no supplement to running fast you just got to do it um also in in there's you won't get as much of uh, the shorter ground contact time and when, when you're sprinting as you do with any type of plyometric. Even though we do a lot of plyometrics, 
for a little bit of potentiation before the speed days. And we'll show you some examples of some of the um, plyo work that we do. Um, but you just got to get it in. There's no, there's, you, there's any, nothing really that kind of can simulate sprinting like sprinting. Um, so this is Deshaun. He's going to be doing what is called a flying. You know, we do flying 10s, flying 20s, flying 30s. Uh, we do in and outs, which is basically a 20 buildup, and then we'll hit it again for like 15 out for 10. So it's just like a coast and then back in again. So it's in and outs. Um, and Deshaun's been on the track. He didn't run track in, in high school, but he was a baseball guy. So he was always doing speed work uh, with me when he wasn't at baseball and definitely when he wasn't in football season. Um, so here's him, he's just building up and then hit it and then just, you know, 15, 20 meters, but it's just that explosiveness, getting that separation, firing that central nervous system as high as it can go. Um, as you guys probably most know that Deshaun's not the strongest um, guy out there. Most people said he wouldn't make it in the league past three years because of how small he was, but Again, speed, speed kills. Um, and, and that separation that he's able to get is one of the biggest things that we still strive to, to maintain. Um, I know he was concerned after he turned 30, people telling him, oh, you're going to get slower. And so we had to sit down and talk. And it's, it's, it's a myth. You know, as long as his strength to weight ratio is the same and, and he's still doing his work, he still will be just as fast. Now, the problem is he probably can't handle as much load. So injuries are a little bit more prevalent, um, but it's just a matter of managing that, that load. Um, we also do sled contrast with top end work. So he build up with the sled and then you'll see him come out here and he'll hit it uh, fast with the sled. And it's only, I think we had on there like um, 15, I think it's 15, 20 pounds. Um, Usually it's around 10% like of, of, of body weight, if that. Uh, just depends on the person. Again, it's not just knowing your, who you're working with. Um, and then it's just uh, getting getting that, that speed in. So here, here we go. Just hit. And then we'll rest, you know, good two or three minutes. And then hit it again without the, without the sled. And we'll hit like four sets of that. Um, and before that, we'll uh, usually kind of hit some some plyometric work, you know, but um, it's usually his workouts do not last that long, um, but it's useful as it gets the job done, right? Um, this is Deshaun again, um, see. This is straight leg bound, right? <clears throat> so that's me, don't have a sled, so I use a bungee, uh, it's in Florida couldn't travel with the sled or anything else, but they got a bungee and I, and I actually got a good workout in. So, um, so yeah, we use straight leg bounds uh, with and without resistance. Also it mimics the last phase of the stride cycle of the power coming back down to the ground. Um, it's hard to do wrong, meaning that you normally will fire from the glute down, which it helps a lot of people learn that the synchronization of the timing of the power um, being put down into the ground. Um, so we'll go with that, uh, with the straight leg, uh, with and without. Um, and then here's uh, the without. So we get a run in and then just pulling back. And you can see it just uh, fires from the glute down, getting big separation, pulling back. And again, finding that point on the ground where it's directly under your center of mass and you're able to put the force down and, and, and go forward. I um, think I also have, um, yeah, Miles Sanders running back Eagles. He's doing the same thing. You'll notice he's has a little bit better range of motion, but the pullback is not as strong as 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 Deshaun's is. And so that's something we worked on um, in the off season with him is just being able to get that uh, timing right and that power of of, of pushing forward. Um, <clears throat> for top end, also we use wickets. It helps with the, um, the recovery phase and just getting, um, getting them tall 
and getting that heel recovery and getting that foot right back down underneath them. Um, wickets, it's one of those things you're going to have to get a, you're going to have to use a lot of them if you, if you have a big group. So it's pretty hard to do. Um, luckily we usually keep our groups pretty small, um, but usually between six and a half and seven feet usually works pretty well. And then you can adjust from there per, per person or per group. Um, this is a big uh, DN from Nebraska. Ade, uh, not from Nebraska, sorry, Notre Dame. You're going to be mad. Um, but yeah, as you can see, it's a, it's a big guy um, and moving well, right? And that's, that's the key, um, staying tall, right? And getting that, uh, that leg up under him and then being able to um, get right back into to, to position. You see, that's pretty good position, good airtime. That heel comes straight up under his butt right there, and then it tries to form that, that number four. Uh, from then, he's just changing the direction of that thigh and blocking it and then bringing it right back down into the ground. So it's blocked and now pulling back into the ground and then hitting, pushing forward. All right. So yeah, those are the pretty much um, what we do with Top in, it's, you just got to get it in. A um, couple variations is the straight leg, which which helps fire the glutes, the wickets, which helps the recovery. Um, <clears throat> here's a DJ Reed also <laughs> doing the wickets. Staying tall, obviously he hit a couple, but uh, is, is, he just has to get back down to the ground. He's one that had that leg like to just dangle in the back. And we just gotta be able to be a little bit off the ground and then firing that heel up underneath underneath you. Um, talking about uh, plyos, some of the plyos that we do before speed workouts. Um, a lot of one-legged stuff, especially for football. Um, I don't do a lot of uh, multi-directional stuff because I'm a linear guy and I, I stay in my lane. Um, but still, one-legged stuff carries over whether you're doing multi-direction or linear. Uh, we do one-legged hops, which is me demonstrating um, one-leg hops. We do it from a standstill and then just really powering forward, pulling back, going as far as you can. Um, we have little, I think this particular day, challenging an athlete because he thought he was going pretty far. So I was he challenged me, so I think I lost though. Um, so that's one of them. Um, this is not a plyo, but it helps fire the central nervous system, um, helps kind of get you ready uh, for some fast movement. Um, and it's just making sure that the body's firing um, and everything's in, in order. Like if, if you'll see when, if you have someone do it at the beginning, they'll, you'll see them misfire. So their body is just kind of like, it's like a car when it, the, the spark plugs are in it, it's just misfire and you can hear it and you can see it. Uh, this is Sid, he's a um, national record holder in the 110 hurdles for India. So we're just doing high knees, you're not really pulling, you're using the band to hold at that angle and it's just for five seconds. So you're just going as fast as you can, um, up and down, holding position, keeping the core tight and then uh, firing up fast as you can and just really getting that central nervous system to be fired before uh, uh, speed work. Um, as far as the strength part, um, and for top end mechanics, you can do what we call a stride cycle uh, with the bar overhead. Um, and this is the younger kid, this is actually my daughter. And it's just stepping over, going through the cyclical motion, toes up, right? You always got to try to keep the toes up. Don't let them, um, you see a good toe up position. Don't point the toes down. You're always trying to keep the toes up as long as, as possible. And you can see here, she's landing pretty flat, which is actually a good thing. Um, you want to be flat underneath yourself. It's not on your heels, but it's, uh, it's, it's flat. And then you're getting that stretch reflex and then you're coming right back up. And what you'll notice as soon as she hits, look where the, the thigh 
knee position is, heels underneath the butt, right? And just trying to keep the core tight um, and, and getting a very good control of your body and just feeling the, the cyclical motion of, of the legs. Um, let's see. Um, weight room. Um, actually, backtrack. We'll go with um, overspeed. It's a lot of people ask me about overspeed. And I, I always say for my elite, elite, elite athletes who are technically sound, we'll do it occasionally. Um, but the risk versus reward is, is sometimes not always there with everybody. So if you have an athlete whose technique is not there, you would never do it. So combine guys never do it just because their technique is never usually a hundred percent, you know, plus the risk versus reward. It's not there. It, I don't think it, uh, it will ever be there for most people, except for the, the top elite sprinters that, that can probably do it. And then you have to have a system like a 1080 sprint or something similar that pulls you at that measured uh, speed so that you're not overdoing it. And then they're overstriding and even more um, injuries. So no with the overspeed. Uh, weights is two parts, um, injury prevention and strength gains. So here's uh, Elijah Griffin, he's USC coming out this year. Um, very weak core, as you'll see. Um, and, and just we always try to um, prevent torque, right? Prevent stuff. So um, just pull it. Um, and then trying to keep the core locked in. Obviously, you see he's bent a little bit and not doing it, but he, he got to start somewhere. This was his first day. So, um, other injury prevention stuff is um, like what Deshaun's doing foot strength, um, keeping the hips locked in, getting a little stretch on the hamstring. Good range of motion, just good positions. Um, Hamstring strength, um, Nordics are great. Um, this is Amon Ra St. Brown, um, probably the strongest athlete I've seen um, and far as hamstring wise, as you'll see, um, super strong. Um, most of your athletes won't be able to get this far or do that, but you can put your hands down, guide yourself down and then push yourself up to where you can catch it and then pull back. Um, you can do it eccentrically only and then just come back up. Um, but yeah, this is another thing for preventing hamstring injuries. Um, one of the biggest things with him though is that he's gotten so strong that his, his, his mobility is, is limited. So that's one of the things that we're kind of working with him. Um, as far as the liftings, Deshaun never does, and it's, I don't, there's no reason why we didn't, it wasn't a chosen thing that why we decided to not do ever back squats. Um, he just doesn't like it. I started with him when he was young, so he's a creature of habit. So doesn't like the bar on his back. So we do squat jumps with uh, dumbbells. Uh, oops, I'll show you here. And just exploding up, controlling the weight as you land, exploding back up. Again, popping the hips forward, getting that extension and explosiveness. Um, this is him uh, doing longer straight leg, which is more of a conditioning part, strength part of what we'll do. So it's not for speed. It's just firing the glutes and we go for 100 yards. So. Um, we get that in um, the stride cycle also for strengthening work. We do longer bounds for strengthening work. One of our main lifts, deadlift, trap bar deadlift, hang cleans, step ups, Bulgarians. Um, not too much outside of that. You know, we don't really, especially with a lot of my sprinters, um, kind of keep it pretty, pretty simple. But we do lift pretty heavy to get the strength gains. The, the strength to weight ratio is huge. And we try to try to maximize that. That's AJ Richardson who's with the Cardinals. John Ross, we do uh, hand cleans. Uh, we don't do too much uh, cleans from the floor because they're always upright and not accelerating from a block position. So we do hand cleans. We don't do hang snatches, which I do with my track athletes because of the shoulder aspect involved. We don't want to get the shoulders hurt. 
take a beating. Um, and then um, we, um, we do some even longer running in the fall. Deshaun will go 150 meters um, in the fall and we'll do reps of, <laughs> I think we start off at four and then we only get up to about six. That's probably all he can handle. But yeah, it's longer running. Um, and we get into that. Uh, let's see. This is Dante Johnson, receiver for the Pittsburgh Steelers, working out with him in Florida. And they're just, you know, probably 80% and just getting it in, getting a lot of running in more, more a little bit more volume. Um, but yeah. Um, next, um, sand. Um, we kind of briefly went over it, but yeah, sand, it's, um, it's the opposite of putting force down in a short amount of time. Um, you kind of, if you put more force, you go deeper into the sand. So your body kind of tends to just slap at the ground and uh, um, not really put too much power. Um, load management, we talked about with um, um, in, in the, the seven laws, but basically what we do, uh, we usually go in the, in, the, in the beginning two to three times a week. Um, we'll probably sometimes start off at two, we'll work up to three, and then we'll back down to two. In season, he still does speed work. Um, and those workouts are about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and that's pretty, like the, the longest part is the warm up, you know, and which he normally does it on Tuesdays if, uh, on our normal week where he plays Sunday. Monday's all about recovery. Tuesday, we'll have him warm up. We'll go uh, do the warm up. We'll do like maybe like one or two plyos. And then whether we do acceleration or top end, then we'll mix it up between the weeks. We'll do one week, we'll do acceleration. Next week, we'll do top end. And literally, it probably max would be four runs. So we'll be like, let's say if we had resistance, we do a one resistance, one without, two sets. Um, if we're doing uh, top end work, uh, we'll probably do two to three. And uh, that's a wrap um, for his speed work during the season. Now, what it does is just maintains him a little bit better so that during week 16, he still has that explosiveness, the strength to weight ratio is there and um, he's good to go. So that's it for me. So if you guys have any questions, um, any things that you wanna know, anything else you wanna delve into, um, more than welcome, more than happy to kinda answer any and all those questions um, that you have. Hopefully it wasn't uh, a new, um, hopefully you learned some stuff. Hopefully it's not uh, uh, too boring. Uh, normally I'm the coach who, um, minimal words, you know, in, in key and athletes, um, I like to use the, the minimalist approach is to keep it simple, right? So um, trying to um, give back cues and make them as uh, simple as possible for the athlete, especially the younger, the athlete. So um, yeah. All right, so we got some questions. Uh, static stretching versus dynamic warm up. Okay, so static stretching, like we talked about, is is at the very end um, of the day at night. Um, definitely, a dynamic warm up is best. Um, I believe that you can actually warm up and get the core temperature warm and not stretch and be ready. But mentally, I think a lot of athletes feel like they need to stretch. So you give them that, uh, um, that option. Um, I know my wife ran for Santa Monica track club with the, the legend Joe Douglas, and he never had them stretch, but they warmed up quite a bit and, um, uh, they never had any, any injuries. So that's just the main thing of, uh, a good warm up 
dynamic. As long as the core temperature is warm, you're good to go and then leave the static stretching for at night when you're warm and then can turn things off. Um, and if that's it, I think that's about all. All right. Appreciate everybody who came on. Hope you have a good night. Um, and God bless. We'll see you. Bye.